Yeah, so um, back in October 2012, I was working in the telecom industry and I had gotten involved in one of the first CICD efforts at my workplace. And I had my project lead come by and, and explain to me like what the current situation was. And he said, so Eric, we make releases roughly every six months, right? And development of those releases typically start at around a year before the actual release. But the verification department doesn't really get started until about three months before the release date. So I was thinking then, well, surely this, surely this means that sometimes the developers have to wait a long, long time between developing the feature and getting feedback on it. Worst case, it can be several months. So if they get a bug reported to them, they have to make the mother of all context switches to try to get back into what they were doing. And if you are anything like me and having a problem like remembering what you did this morning, imagine trying to remember what you did seven or eight months ago. It's tough. And my project lead then said, so this delay between development and verification, we need to get that down from a couple of months to a couple of hours. And I'm thinking, this is a crazy big step. But it turns out, and I've been shown over and over again since then, that the step is actually not that crazy. But you do need good inputs. You do need to know where your bottlenecks are. And for that, we need metrics. So, I am Erik Stanerson. And I'm Andrea Frittoli. And, yeah, so today we are going, oh, welcome to building DevOps metrics for your choice of CD tools through CD events. So today we're going to talk about CD events. We're going to introduce them. We are going to talk about DevOps metrics. And also we're going to discuss how the two technology actually can fit together. Thank you, Andrea. So I'm going to start by talking a little bit about the CD events project. So what we're trying to achieve on a conceptual level is to define a common language for communication in CI-CD solutions and surrounding areas. What we are concretely doing to try to achieve this is two things. We are developing a specification for events in CD, and we are building a number of software development kits or SDKs for producing, sending, and receiving these events. And let's dig a little bit into the specification first. So in the specification, we define a number of events. They can be related to source code, they can be related to pipelines, they can be related to deployments or other areas that we want to cover. For each event, we define like what are the mandatory and optional parameters that both the, the sender might want to communicate and the receivers might want to know about this message. And also, since we build on top of cloud events, which is a CNCF project, we also provide some guidelines for how to use the fields that are provided by cloud events when you're sending these events. So based on the specification, we can then produce a number of SDKs to help people build uh, or yeah, send and receive events in, in their own languages and platforms. If anyone attended the excellent talk by uh, Edison Eski yesterday, talking about generating clients from schemas, that is also something that we uh, want to do. So Andrea has actually been working on the schema uh, quite a lot lately, and we have a goal to be able to do that, but we're not right there yet. But with these SDKs, things like producing a new pipeline run queued event can be done without having to like manually put together a JSON object. So you can use the SDK to create your message and send it. So then with these SDKs and application code to produce events, we can then work on integrations and proof of concepts to try out the things that we are defining and, and see what are the uh, attributes that are missing, what are the, the information that is needed by an observer or a receiver of this message. And it sort of feeds back into a cycle, a development cycle. Actually, I probably shouldn't call it a cycle. It's more like a reverse tornado, just trying to pick up, thread some information or nuggets of, of ideas and, and useful stuff and create some order out of it. That's what we're doing. 
and when I say we, it's it's not just the the CD events team, which is uh, like responsible for and maintaining the specification. We actually get a lot of help from people involved in other CI/CD projects. So at least one of the SDKs that we have, and quite a lot of the proof of concepts and integrations have been built by members of other communities that we have collaborated with. But uh, let's talk a little bit about what we want to achieve with CD events. Why are we doing this? We have covered this in more detail in previous talks that we've had. So for the purpose of this session, there are two goals that I want to focus on. One is interoperability. So making things work together by providing a common language. So switching out a tool should not be hell. It should be quite easy because the tools are all speaking the same language. The second one, which is more relevant for this talk, is observability. So providing directives on what to send and when to send to tell the surrounding world what you are doing and what you are achieving. And through this observability comes a great opportunity for building metrics. And uh, we have some metrics that we're going to talk about today, Andreas. So do you want to talk about those? Yes. Um, thanks, Eric, for the great introduction to CD events. Um, so today we are going to focus on a special kind of metrics, which we call uh, DevOps metrics. And yeah, while DevOps practices are becoming ubiquitous, different organizations, they are at different points in their journey to DevOps. Um, and going, continuing in this journey requires a continuous investment of resources. And so uh, this organization needs to, to understand um, if they're uh, getting uh, the investment pay, being paid off, basically, if they're getting a return, for, if they're investing resources in the right area, if they're focusing their team on the right tasks. Um, apart from this, I um, mean, the recent surge in uh, Software supply chain attacks is not making things easier because it puts extra pressure on the team to like starting bringing security left uh, and implementing pipeline in a secure way and making sure that the, the build system are uh, proof and secure and so forth. So uh, I wanted to mention the state of the DevOps report by published by Puppet since 2013. They have been looking at how organization has been implementing DevOps practices um, yeah, in their organizations. And um, what they do, they divide all the group organization in three groups, uh, like low, uh, medium, and high, uh, depending on this level of success they have in, their, in this implementation. And something that uh, they have seen over the years, almost 10 years now, is that uh, there is a strong correlation between this level of success and um, the numbers they get on specific on a specific set of metrics, so how well they are doing on a specific set of key metrics uh, that uh, they have identified. And to calculate these metrics, these DevOps metrics, uh, you need uh, data. And as you can imagine, uh, getting this data doesn't scale very well with uh, increasing number of repositories and teams and applications. So if you have one, you may go and collect this data manually, but if you have a larger organization, it doesn't work that well. So what kind of data we are talking about? So the four metrics that the state of the DevOps report refers to are the DORA metrics. You probably or may have heard about them. Uh, they've been developed by the DORA group, which is uh, DevOps Research and Assessment Group. I always forget the name. <laughs> um, and what these metrics are, uh, develop, uh, deployment frequency, so how often do we deploy into production, lead time for changes, so how long it takes for a change in the code to actually get in production, change failure rate, how often does a change in production causes an issue or a failure in, in our application or service, and finally the time to restore uh, the service. So how long does it take after a failure to actually go back to service uh, working uh, uh, nicely? And something that is uh, apparent uh, looking at this list already is that no single tool is actually going to be able to provide the data for all the metrics 
I mean, the, if you look at the CD landscape, it's relatively fragmented. We have tools which focus vertically on areas of your entire pipeline. So you will need to use a combination of tools to collect all this data. And here is where CD events we think can help. Uh, because on the producing side, so when you're creating the events, it provides uh, it provides um, kind of a, a minimum model for uh, the tools, for uh, a minimum data model for the tools uh, that they can produce to be interoperable with the rest of the world. And on the receiving side, it makes um, ingesting the data, consuming it, storing it, and processing it easier. And what um, we believe is that um, for CD events, we can foster an ecosystem of tools that can process this data. And um, as long as uh, more tools become compatible with CD events, then it will also lower the barrier for introducing new tools or switching out tools. Because let's say you have uh, your setup with uh, your tool chain and your um, workflows running and you're collecting metrics and you decide to introduce a new tool or switch out one of the tools, as long as uh, the new tool produces CD events, then it should seamlessly integrate with existing metric collection that you have in place. So let's look a bit then at how we uh, produce the metrics that Andrea talked about. The first one we're gonna look at is probably the most straightforward one and it's deployment frequency. Essentially just counting how often and how many times we deploy. So let's pretend that we have a setup like this. We have our, yeah, we have an environment, a production environment running some form of, of service. Uh, we're gonna use potato for this example because it's, it's fun. And um, yeah, we have a new version of uh, this image coming in and we want to deploy it. And we will say that we both want to deploy yeah, we want to upgrade the existing environment and we want to deploy a new environment and, and install the service there through some orchestrator. It could be Tekton controlling kubectl, it could be Argo CD, Spinnaker, Captain, something else that uh, helps us uh, do this orchestration. What we provide in CD events then are two related events. One called service upgraded for when you uh, upgraded an existing environment and one called service deployed for when you deploy a new environment. And just essentially counting those messages, an observer has enough information to be able to count deployment frequency. So that was not very difficult. Let's move on to something slightly more involved. So the next one is lead time for changes. How long does it take us to go from an approved change to this change actually being built, packaged, uploaded and deployed. So let's go through that journey. We start with the change. We have the same observer as we had last time. So first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna need to make this change available in our repository. So we involve SEM. We create a pull request, we get it approved. And when it's merged, a change merged event is sent telling the uh, surrounding world some information about like, what is the repository where this change has happened, what is the SHA of the uh, commit, things like that. That can help uniquely identify this change down the line. Next, we're probably not going to just run the source code, we need to build it. And as part of the build, or as the last step of the build, we have some sort of artifact created it could be a jar file, it could be a container or an image rather. But when that is available, we send an artifact packaged event. And this connects back to the source. So we know what source we built or we know the change that we built this from. And it also identifies in this case, the image. But just having an image on the build server doesn't really help anyone. So next step is to connect it to a registry so we upload the image and then the registry can send an artifact published event. So this announces to the rest of the world that this artifact is now ready to be used. Which means that it can be picked up by an orchestrator who can deploy as we saw in the previous picture, maybe upgrade something and then send a service upgraded event. And with these, we again have enough information to declare 
lead time for changes. But Andrea, I think we've had just about enough slides for some time. Mm -hmm. Are we brave enough to demo this live? Yeah, let's give it a try. Okay, so first I'll quickly introduce the demo setup that we're using uh, for these two metrics. Um, so if I can use the pointer. No. And there you are. Yeah, maybe. Okay, so here in the top corner we have the sources of events. So we're using GT as an SCM. So where it's, we do our code changes, pull requests, and so forth. We have a container registry where we are storing our container images. And we have a Kubernetes cluster running on IBM Cloud where actually the entire thing is running. And we have a nice trick through Knative to take events from the API, uh, the API server in Kubernetes and convert them in uh, cloud events. So we get all these sources of data and we feed them into a project called Tecton Triggers which allows to react to basically HTTP requests with a JSON payload. And through uh, the Go SDK plus some uh, other tooling that we created here, we call CD Eventer, we basically generate our CD event. So here in the middle, there, this is a cloud events broker. This is powered by Kinetic Eventing. And so basically every, message, every CD event that is produced um, is deposited here on the broker. It's like a channel. And the nice feature of this is that then you can define triggers and triggers are like subscriptions. So you can say, you can decide how many clients and which client will receive which messages and you can have filter logic and so forth. So, and for, the, uh, for this uh, demo specifically, we have a trigger here that takes all the CD events and send them to another instance of Tecton, which basically allows us to, to visualize them so that for the purpose of the demo, we can see those events. And they're actually being stored in etcd. Um, but you could have another database where you store all your events, a document database or something like that. Or these are other tools that you can use to visualize um, events. So let's see um, if the, we can show the demo. So I need to mirror display first. Hopefully this is readable. Okay, so we, uh, Eric uh, discussed, presented two metrics. The first one is the deployment frequency. So the first thing that we are going to do um, is to deploy an application. So we are using the uh, Potato application. This is the container image um, that we're using. And I'm just going to create a deployment from that image. Right, um, so we can have a look. Isn't he fantastically cute? I really <laughs> like this, this character. And here it is in version 0 .1 .0. Um, And the other thing that we can do, we can open the Tecton dashboard. And here in the dashboard, uh, see, I can make it a bit bigger. You can see a service upgraded or actually a service deployed event here um, that was sent just a few seconds ago. And if we look into the event, not the best position to use the track, but okay. So we have the context with the type. In the custom data, we have all the data. We put uh, all the data that was in the original event so this is coming from the Kubernetes API. Um, and finally, if I scroll to the bottom, this is the, the, key, the core data model that we are providing. So this is a subject and the subject is a service. The source, this is the IP address of our Kubernetes API service. Um, the ID is the ID of the subject. The subject is the application that we deployed. So in this case, it's a deployment. And so this is the whole path uh, to the deployment. And the key is that the combination of ID and source must be unique. So it must be uniquely identifying the resource that we are talking about. Additionally, we get extra context like the artifact ID. So this is the image that we just deployed with the SHA um, at the environment where it was um, 
deployed and for the demo we are using the namespace so this is the kubernetes namespace where we deploy the application all right um so and you can see i tested this demo a few times and I get the nice thing is get I get a number of uh, deployed and upgrade service deployed and service upgraded events which are stored in that CD and I can see them here and I could run some queries and get some data about how often am I deploying and how often am I upgrading the service. Um, it's a bit uh, more verbose uh, that you might expect because in this case I deployed the application and I got some service upgraded events and this is because we are uh, basically tapping directly from the AP Kubernetes API service, which every time there is a small change in the deployment definition, maybe the status updates, then it sends an event, so we get that event as well. Uh, but let's continue. So from here, um, the, other, um, the other metric that we wanted to talk about is the lead time for changes. So how much time it takes for a change to get into production. So first thing, we have to actually create a change. Um, and for that, I'm creating a branch and opening the Docker file. And we're going to run a different version of the potato application. So changing to version 011. Okay, I'm pushing the branch. Right, we get a handy link here. It open up the Gitty interface. We can see the change that was made here. Looks good. So let's create a pull request. Right, um, so in Gitty is configured with webhooks that are pointing to our environment or tecton triggers. So now that if I pull, uh, merge this change and I switch back to the Tecton dashboard, yeah, you can see it's running now. Um, we just got a change merged event. Okay, and similarly to before, um, we have the type in the context. In the custom data, we have the original event from GT. Um, with all the details from the pull request and the owner and the repo, etc. And here we get the slice of the data model that we define as standard on CD event side. So we have the ID, which is the Git SHA of the change that was just merged. The source, which is the uh, URL to our Git instance slash the owner and repo. So that again, the combination of these two uh, uniquely identifies this subject. Um, and we get some extra content like the repository ID. So next step, then um, we have a change um, that we have made. So we want to run a build. And with a version. So this is going to take a second, but not too much, hopefully. Uh, the build script is going to uh, create a container image, a new version of the container image. And it's going to send an artifact packaged event about it. And then um, it's also going to push this new container image to the container registry. The container registry has a webhook configured. Um, it's a nice feature found in the Azure container registry. Actually, you can configure webhooks. So it's coming down to triggers again, and we are converting it to CD events. OK, so we have the new container image here. I can set up artifact. RT, uh, To the new image. All right, um, let's go back to the dash to the Tecton dashboard. Sorry, and we have here two new events: artifact packaged and artifact published. As we expected, in the context, we have the event type. Um, right, and our subject is an artifact. The source is the script that I just executed. The ID here is the artifact ID. So this is not yet in the 
pack the format, but we are considering using Perl package URL as a format uh, because in this case it's a Docker image, but it could be another type of artifact, could be a jar file or anything else. And we want to make sure that we have like a consistent format for addressing artifacts. Um, what is interesting here is that uh, for the artifact package, we get a link to the last change. So this is a git char and the repo uh, of the last change that is included is in this artifact. So it's a bit simplifying the model here. We're considering an artifact that comes from a single repository. In future, we plan to extend to multiple repositories. And so this uh, allows us to link the change event with the artifact package. The other event is the artifact published. So this comes from the container registry. The container registry does not necessarily know about uh, the repository this comes from. So that's why we have two events to create the link. So we have the event type. This is the, in the custom data, we get again, uh, what was coming from the container registry originally. And here we have the pearl, which is consistent with what we've seen, we seen before, and the source, which is the, this instance of the Azure Container Registry. Right, so we have got the build um, done. So the next thing that we want to do is to actually update our deployment so we can use kubectl set image on the deployment we created before uh, and set the uh, image to the new image that we just built. Right, and if we do that and go back to our friend here, there you go. We got the 1.1 one, one version with arm raised and red shoes. <laughs> and yeah, we have service upgraded event that is similar to the service deployed. So we got the type. We got the Kubernetes API server data, and we got here the artifact ID and environment production. So these events basically put together, they give us enough information so we can calculate how long it took for the original change we've made to get deployed into production, right? So, and we can do this for every change that we do in our system or in our multiple repositories and calculate this uh, metric consistently. Right, uh, that's all for the demo. Let me switch back. Okay. Oh, of course, it's the wrong tab. All right, I think that's it. Okay, um, so with this, we've seen the first two met Dora metrics and we see them in practice. There are other two metrics we wanted to discuss and that we are uh, working on. The first one is the change failure rate. So this is how often a change that we are implementing is actually causing an issue in production. Um, so this is interesting from event uh, point of view. So let's dig into it. So for the number, uh, so for, for this, uh, we could consider this metric as a ratio between the number of deployments that we're doing and the number of issues or incidents that we are seeing in production. And for the number of deployments, we already have this information. For the number of incidents, uh, we don't. I mean, we could look into the versions that we are deploying and make some assumption and say, okay, actually we are rolling back to a previous version, so that means that there was an issue, uh, but this does not give us a complete picture uh, because um, counting incident actually requires more information as incident may come from different kinds of causes. So it could be that there is a, an issue in the application that I'm uh, deploying. Let's say I'm putting out a new potato server with the wrong color of the shoes, no one likes the application, that's, they file a bug, that's an issue. It could be that there is a configuration error, so we are working in, for the demo in Kubernetes type of environment. Maybe there is an issue in the manifest, they put the wrong SHA, something doesn't work. Or it could be an environment error, so something maybe external to the application, but dependency we depend on that is not working anymore, or it could be something else. And also, 
uh, who can discover the incident, so who can produce the, the uh, information about incident happening. Again, it can be an orchestrator like Kubernetes or whatever system we use. Um, it can be a monitoring system that is looking, watching the application, so something is wrong, maybe their performance is degraded. It can be the application itself, um, or it could be an end user or a DevOps team which is looking at the application and say, okay, well, something is wrong here. So how can we deal with all these kind of possible uh, sources uh, and type of incidents? Again, we want to solve this and try and solve this with an uh, incident event. So this is not part of the CD event spec yet, uh, but we want to extend the spec to include a new bucket of uh, events. We, we group our events in different areas and this would be a new kind of bucket of events um, that would allow us to, to model this kind of uh, incidents. And so you would have, like we described, incidents from the operator, uh, from a monitor, from the application itself, or from an external users, all going to an observer. So we would collect these incidents, and we would need to make we will need to make sure that we have enough context in this in this incident to be able to kind of uh, correlate them with each other, so that we can know how many incidents we actually have, and produce the change failure rate out of that. And the next metric, similarly, time to restore service, uh, we need to know about uh, restoring the service, so when things come back to be uh, working fine. And again, what can restore the service? We could roll, change the version, roll back the image to the previous version or install a new version. You could have a configuration change, scaling up the service, maybe it's under pressure or adding new hardware even. Or maybe it's something completely external uh, that is solving the incident. Oops, sorry, too quick. Um, and so uh, the key thing is that uh, we need to have enough information to correlate this back to the sources of the incident. So we'll need to make sure that in the data model we have things like, um, well, the environment ID, um, the artifact uh, that is deployed with the version. So we have this informa enough information to be able to connect these events to the previous event. And that will make it possible to calculate the metrics. And yeah, we think that uh, a lot of the value from CD events is that we, have, we will have a, a common way to address this uh, data model, so these fields uh, to indicate what an environment ID is, what an artifact ID is, so that you can reason across um, events that may come from many different sources. And again, with um, events, in place, if we look this on the similar diagram as before, we can see resolution type of events coming from the different sources, and we collect those as an observer, and finally we can uh, calculate the time to restore. Something we want to mention as well, um, there is a project called Captain within the CNCF, um, and they use cloud events today, and they have some uh, modeling around uh, this type of events. So we are discussing with the project to see if there is a surface of the events that, uh, or a fraction of the events that they define today that we could use uh, as a standard for CD events as well. So we look forward next time to be able to demo this as well. Thank you, Andrea. Uh, it's been a little bit sweaty this, uh, this afternoon. I'm not sure if you noticed, but I think network stability took an early lunch today, but it came back, so it's really yeah. nice that it worked. <laughs> But um, we're nearing the end of our talk, so we would like to leave you with uh, a few messages to, to take away. First is that metrics are tricky. There are some really important metrics that we want to be able to capture, but there are also a whole lot of different sources of data for these metrics. And it, it's our firm belief that having a common language really helps here. So rather than having to understand 10 or 50 or 100 different types of events or hooks or anything like that, if we can get it into one language and one set of events, then observing this is or can be a lot easier. And that is what we would like to achieve with CD events. But we are not going to be able to do that alone. So in the demo, Andrea showed translators between existing uh, 
yeah, webhooks or, or event type things to CD events. Uh, we have had support from some communities to get uh, various solutions to natively produce CD events, but those are the things that are going to be needed for CD events to, to have any level of success and for people to be able to benefit from the observability and interoperability that it provides. So what me and Andrea would really like is for anyone who is interested in the work that we're doing, want to read more or want to get involved, to go to cdevents.dev. There you can find the spec, you can find the SDKs, you can find our communication channels, you can find GitHub, uh, all that stuff. So uh, yeah, we, uh, we are looking forward to getting in touch with you. With that, we would like to thank you all for attending the talk. I've been Erik Stanesson, this is Andrea Frittoli, and uh, we would like to open up the floor for questions. If anyone has a question, I have a mic here. And thanks everyone for being with us on a Friday afternoon after a long <laughs> conference week. We're all kind of exhausted and so appreciate that. <laughs>